Hello, welcome. My name is Astrid Bennett. I'm the president of Surface Design Association, a membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. I'm delighted to welcome you to this week's Textile Talk, Artists Interpret Climate Data with Linda Gass and Tally Weinberg. Weinberg. Textile Talk webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilt and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. First, a few housekeeping announcements. This is a webinar. Your screens and mics are not showing. We welcome questions, which we'll answer at the end of all the artists' presentations. Please submit them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We're honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming. We respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. Please use the Q&A for questions, chat box for greeting others, and survey for commentary or ways we can improve. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them on or off. This webinar would not be possible without the support of our sponsors, Artistic Artifacts, Orophil, CNT Publishing, eQuilter.com, HandyQuilter, Misty Fuse, Moda Fabrics, Nine Patch Fabrics, Schiffer Publishing, The Quilt Show, Quilt Mania, and Empty Spools Seminars. How do we respond to the effects of climate change, pollution, and contamination of our water resources? What will inspire us to change our behavior? Today's presentation of studio practice of science for social change is fascinating. It reinforces the critical role of science in understanding our world. California artist Linda Gass will take us on a multimedia journey for behind the scenes look at the research concepts and the art making process of her artwork. Tally Weinberg will be sharing her Datascapes project, a series of weavings and coiled sculptures interpreting climate data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Ad Administration. Linda Gass will be our first presenter today. This Bay Area artist is best known for her labor intensive stitched paintings about climate change, water and land use. And she is, by the way, a SACWA member as well. She learned to love textiles as a child when her grandmother taught her to sew and embroider. Winner of the prestigious 2012 Fleisch Hacker Eureka Fellowship Award, her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including the Museum of Craft and Design, Oakland Museum, the Bellevue Art Museum, and the US Embassy in Moscow. And it has been published in books and magazines. When she's not making art or championing environmental causes, you can find her backpacking, camping, and hiking in the wilderness areas of the West, where she finds much of the inspiration for her work. Linda, we're ready for you. Well, thank you so much for that nice introduction, Astrid. And I'm really excited to be here today and to be sharing this talk with Tally Weinberg. And thank you to all the rock star organizations who make these textile talks happen. So now I am going to share my screen here. Okay, are we set with the... Uh... First slide. I'm assuming so. Somebody will get on and tell me if I'm not. <laughs> so before I get into my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from my home in Los Altos, which is located in the Adobe Creek watershed. We're in the midst of a prolonged drought, so the creek is dry during a time when it should be filled with water. Los Altos is located on the historic land of the Puchan and the unceded homeland of the Muecna Ohlone. This land was and continues to be of great importance to this tribe. I recognize that I benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. And I express my sincere gratitude and respect for indigenous elders past, present and future 
who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. So I'm both an environmental activist and an artist, and I combine the two to make artwork about climate change, water and land use issues. My approach is to use beauty to encourage people to look at the hard issues we face. I'm inspired by the connections between humans and the water and land we need to survive. I work primarily in textiles, usually painting bird's eye view landscapes on silk, which I then stitch on a sewing machine to add more design and texture. I'm interested in how landscapes change over time and climate change will have a significant impact, whether it's sea level rise, wildfires, or how much snow falls in our mountains. So my artwork begins with an environmental issue, usually related to water. And once I've selected an issue, I do extensive research to learn more about it by doing site visits, reading scientific publications, talking to scientists, reading about the history and seeking out historical and present day maps and photographs. My research process is integral to developing the concept for my artwork. It helps me to refine my choice of subject matter and the composition for my work. As general research, I spend a lot of time during the summer seeking out the headwaters of the streams and rivers that we rely on for survival. And they're always located in the most beautiful places I've ever seen. The wilderness is also where I go to find magic and to refresh my perspective on life. It's vast and unforgiving, and it reminds me of my place in the universe. You can only reach these headwaters by foot, and it usually takes several days to get there. So I do a lot of backpacking with my life partner, Rob. And climate change is now impacting our backpacking trips with frequent intense wildfires becoming one of the additional challenges we face in the backcountry. This photo was taken in July 2018 while hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail east of Redding, California. We saw smoke and an ominous pyrocumulonimbus cloud in the distance from our campsite. Two days later, we woke up to this. Visibility was about 200 feet and the air was seriously unhealthy to breathe. After that summer, I started carrying an emergency N95 respirator mask in my backpack. And who knew that this would become a scarce and essential item, both for COVID and the local wildfires. So I'm not exactly sure how I got interested in water, water issues, but I think my subconscious interest had something to do with growing up in Los Angeles. My mom is from Luxembourg, a tiny European country where it rains a lot. And she tried to raise my sisters and me with the superstitions of her childhood. So every night we had salad with dinner and we were told that if we didn't finish the salad, it would rain the next day. But everyone in Los Angeles knows that it hardly ever rains in LA, so we couldn't take her threat very seriously. But that planted a nagging question in my mind because I was surrounded by swimming pools, palm trees, lush lawns, and golf courses that needed a lot of water, and it never rained. So where did the water come from? Something didn't make sense to me. And then one day I learned that Los Angeles is really a desert and it imports lots of water from far away to make it look green. And I just haven't been able to let go of it since. So given our short time together today, I'm gonna to focus on two climate data driven artworks and share my research and art making process with you. So the first artwork I'm gonna share is about one of the most visible effects of climate change, sea level rise. And I made this artwork for my recent solo exhibition at the Museum of Craft and Design in San Francisco. The director of the museum asked me if I could make an artwork that would show how sea level rise could affect the museum. And so this is the resulting artwork. Sea level rise is caused by two factors. One is an obvious one, the melting of land ice as the earth warms. And the other one is less obvious, but just as impactful. As the ocean warms, it also expands in volume. Already sea level has risen by seven to eight inches since 1900. And the rate has increased in recent decades to about an eighth of an inch per year. And we can see the effects of this rise during high tide events in the winter called king tides, as shown in this photograph where the water in San Francisco Bay is flowing over the seawalls. One of my favorite resources for understanding sea level rise is published on the website of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, 
referred to as NOAA. Their sea level rise viewer shows the effect of rising sea levels on any place in the United States. When the Trump administration started removing climate change publications from government websites, I became alarmed that I might lose this resource. So I took screenshots just in case it disappeared. Thankfully, it never did. So I'm gonna walk you through the screenshots I took for San Francisco showing one to 10 feet of sea level rise. You can see the impact of sea level rise is subtle until we reach a level of three feet. And that starts impacting San Francisco on the eastern side. At five feet, you start seeing significant impact in other parts of the city. And the eastern side is even more impacted. It became clear to me that the areas of San Francisco around the Dog Patch neighborhood are going to be the hardest hit by sea level rise. And it felt appropriate to focus on that since it's also where the Museum of Craft and Design is located. So now I'm gonna zoom in on the dog patch area and repeat the sea level rise sequence so you can get a more intimate sense of what happens. I've highlighted where the museum's located in Magenta. Although the museum is spared from sea level rise, much of the surrounding neighborhood is not. So for the final installation, I chose to make a series of three artworks, one showing the present day sea level and the other, to the other two showing three and six feet of sea level rise. I chose these amounts based on the scientific projections released in 2018 by the California Ocean Protection Council, a state appoint appointed science and policy advisory team. Projections for 2050 show a modest increase of just one foot. However, by 2100, the likely projections are between three and six feet. And these are the two alternatives I chose to convey in my artwork. If carbon emission levels fall significantly, we'll only have three feet of sea level rise. But if they continue at the current levels, we're gonna have six feet. I know a lot of people who are here today make art. So I'm gonna share the process I use to make this series three artworks. Because the cityscape was identical in all three artworks, I decided to make one silk painting for the base cityscape and then try a technique that was new to me by scanning the original painting, modifying it in Photoshop, and then printing the artworks digitally on silk before stitching them. So here I'm showing the, some of the steps in creating the base silk painting where I build up layers of resist and dye. The resist is a glue-like material that I squeeze out of a bottle with a very fine tip. And when it dries, it contains the dye that I apply after that. And these are a series of photographs I took over a period of two weeks of my progress on the silk painting. And you can see how I build up these layers of dye and resist. When I finished the silk painting, I had it scanned with a high resolution scanner. And then I used Adobe Photoshop to modify that image to show three and six feet of sea level rise by adding a transparent blue layer to show where the flooding occurs. Because sea level rise will also increase the depth of the bay, I wanted to make the bay water a darker shade of blue. So for starters, I wanna show you how I shaded the bay water to be darker to look like this. Okay, so back to the original artwork so I can show you a quick Photoshop demo of how I did this. So first I create a gradient layer from lighter blue to darker blue. And then I tell Photoshop to multiply it with the layer of original artwork beneath it. And then I reduce the opacity of the blue gradient layer to about 60%. Now I'm gonna show you how I created a mask so that the blue gradient layer only darkens the bay water and not the whole cityscape. So back to the original artwork, I'm gonna zoom in to work on it and scroll down to an area of the design that's easy to work on. I put the transparent blue gradient layer back on top, and now I'm gonna make a mask so that the cityscape won't be shaded. The orange areas you see are the mask, and I'm using different brush sizes to mask over the cityscape areas. Now I'm gonna hide the orange masking so you can see the effect of the mask, see how the original cityscape painting is bright again, now I'm gonna get rid of this demonstration layer I've been working on and go back to the original artwork. And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna show you the final mask layer. So see how it doesn't affect the cityscape anymore. 
Next, I'm gonna show you how I created the transparent flooded areas on top of the cityscape, like in this illustration. So I begin by importing a screenshot of the NOAA sea level rise map for six feet of flooding, but it's not the same size as my artwork, so I need to scale it up. To make it easy to align with my artwork, I make it slightly transparent, and then I start scaling it up until the lines line up. Okay, so next I um, make it opaque again, so I can paint a mask layer using it as a guideline. And in the interest of time, rather than doing the demo in Photoshop, I'm just gonna show you the resulting mask layer of transparent blue. And then I turn off the NOAA screenshot layer to reveal the final artwork with both the gradient applied to the bay water and the transparent blue areas in the cityscape. So once again, here's the artwork without the flooded areas on the cityscape. And here's the final artwork again. So I created three digital files in preparation for printing on silk on a large format digital printer. And here's one of the Photoshopped images being printed on paper backed pre-treated silk. The pre-treatment bonds the printer inks to the silk and the paper backing makes it possible to run the silk through the printer. So I'm gonna share a few videos of stitching the artwork. When I'm stitching long straight lines, I like to use the walking foot on my sewing machine. It keeps the multiple layers from moving around too much. And this is a slow motion view of how the walking foot works, which I find really mesmerizing. So this is a time-lapse video of how I stitch the parallel lines in the pavement areas of the cityscape using the free motion embroidery foot and guiding the fabric under the needle. And here's some real-time video of me stitching one of the grass areas. And after I'm done with all the stitching, I hem the artwork by hand before I mount it on the frames. And here's the final stitched artwork of all three, zero, three, and six feet of sea level rise. Now I'm gonna share the research and process behind the artwork, Someday There May Be No More Snow. It's about the decrease in the Sierra snowpack that's occurred during my lifetime. Historically, the mountain snowpack has served as California's largest water storage, and the state's entire system of dams and reservoirs was designed with this in mind. In spring, the snowpack starts melting and slowly releases water throughout the summer to replenish the reservoirs. Climate change is causing warmer air temperatures in winter, which is reducing the snowpack because more of the moisture is falling as rain instead of snow, which results in less water during the summer months. The California Department of Water Resources carefully keeps track of snow measurements at different locations throughout the higher elevations of the state. And they call these locations snow courses, and I've shown them here on this map. The snow survey personnel go to the snow courses on a monthly basis during the winter to measure the snow water equivalent of the snowpack using special snow corn tubes. This photograph was taken on the 1st of April, which is a really important date for water resource managers because that's when the snowpack is usually considered to be at its peak. The extracted core samples are then weighed to determine the snow water equivalent. Once the, once the snow core is weighed, it's converted to inches of snow water equivalent, where each ounce of weight represents one inch. In order to make the artwork, I needed accurate data. I found the raw data for the water content in the snowpack in a database from the California Department of Water Resources, but there were gaps here and there, and I wasn't sure how to calculate an accurate average because of that. So I reached out to some local weather gurus who connected me with some climatologists from the Western Regional Climate Center in Reno. They analyzed the raw data and gave me this spreadsheet with the year and the April 1st snow water equivalent and the difference from the average. So now I'm gonna walk you through my process of what I did with that data and how I experimented with different ways to present it in the most visually compelling way. I began with a standard column graph and you can see the orange average line across the middle. This graph clearly shows the wild fluctuations in snowpack in California. We have very few normal years. 
As long as humans have been keeping track, flood and drought have been the norm. However, this chart didn't really convey the decrease in a visually obvious way. So my next idea was to color code the columns, blue for above average years and brown for below, to see if that would make the trend more visible. But once again, the graph emphasized the fluctuations, but didn't convey an obvious visual decline. Next, I tried a chart showing the difference from the average as negative and positive values, also color coded. This conveyed the trend, especially in the last decade, with five years of severe drought. And although there were a couple of bountiful above average years, they weren't nearly as impressive as earlier decades. So I'm adding these red arrows to emphasize the downward trend I see in this data. I further modified the design by coloring the columns with a gradation from white to either blue or brown, making it easier to compare years that aren't right next to each other. And then this is the actual artwork made from the data. I wanted the artwork to have a fragile quality to it, so I chose to make it out of thread lace. The columns of thread lace are curved to evoke the shape of the snow corn tubes. So now I'm gonna show you the process of making it. The lace is made by stitching a network of threads on dissolvable embroidery stabilizer. So here I'm stitching spirals, symbolic of water for blue above average columns. To ensure the lace holds together after the stabilizer is dissolved, I had to make sure the thread stitches overlapped and interlocked in a grid-like manner. So here I'm stitching the wavy lines, symbolic of dry earth for the brown below average columns. All the designs are guided by my hands, not programmed into the sewing machine, and I changed the thread colors to create the gradation. Once the stitching's done, the stabilizer is removed by dissolving it in water, leaving only the thread lace. It takes about 10 minutes for the stabilizer to fully dissolve. And you can see how the interlocking network of threads creates a strong lace that keeps its shape. I then shaped the thread lace into curved columns using a fabric stiffener called Paverpal. I applied it with gloved hands and, and I massage it into the lace. You wanna apply just the right amount, not so much that you end up clogging the holes in the lace, but enough to stiffen the lace so that it will hold its shape. So once I've covered the whole piece of lace, I formed it on freezer paper and I wrapped it around an acrylic tube that approximates the diameter of the snow corn tubes. This is my little factory here when I was making all these columns. So the next problem to be solved was how do you attach the thread lace columns to the wall so that the hanging mechanism doesn't show? So here's how I chose to solve it. I decided to use tiny, super strong neodymium net magnets. And I've included a penny for scale so you could just see how tiny they are. And then also use magnetic nails. Paint the nails to match the wall color, glue the magnets to the thread lace, and then hammer the nails in the wall and the magnets hold the thread lace to the nails. The next problem to be solved, how do you consistently hammer nails into the wall at a precise location, exactly perpendicular to the wall, and the nail has to stick out exactly one and a quarter inches? My solution to create a wood block guide that's one and a quarter inches thick with a groove just wide enough for the nails. And here I am installing the artwork at the museum using the guide that I created. So here's all 132 nails hammered into the wall. And I actually really like this just by itself. It's given me some ideas for other artwork. Um, and the moment of truth came when I had to attach each thread lace column, praying that I had precisely glued the magnets and put the nails so that they lined up exactly. And thankfully they did. So on a final note, I take the same care in creating the packaging for my artwork as I do in creating the work itself. Those delicate thread lace columns needed to be transported and they could not arrive bent out of shape. So this is one of the four boxes that hold the 60 thread lace columns. And here's one final view of the artwork again. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. 
You can see more of the work in the exhibition listed here below and on my website as well. And you can follow me on social media where I post photographs and video about what I'm up to. So thank you so much for being here today. And I'll be happy to take your questions after Tally's presentation. I'll stop my screen share now. Thank you, Linda. That was really fascinating. And I know we have some wonderful questions and comments in chat about your process. Just to remind, if you have questions, uh, do look at the Q&A box. We can try to address some of them during the Q&A portion. Um, all right. Uh, our next presenter, Tally Weinberg, draws on a history of weaving as a subversive language for women and marginalized groups to create a feminist material archive in response to worsening climate crisis. Through sculpture, drawing, and textiles, she draws relationships between climate change, water, extractive industry, illness, and displacement between personal and communal loss. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Surface Design Journal, the Tulsa Voice, and Ecotone. Recent, um, recent exhibitions include the University of Colorado Art Museum, 21C Museum, Berkeley Art Museum and the Center for Craft. Um, Tally, we're ready for you. Great, thank you. All right, um, can you see my screen yes. okay? Looks good. Okay. Um, well, first, uh, thank you, Astrid, Lucy, SDA, Sakla, and Linda, and everyone who has chosen to spend time with us today. I'd like to start by recognizing and acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Miankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. These lands were their traditional territory prior to their forced removal and are still important to these nations. I was born here in central Illinois, having recently returned after 20 years away. In my lifetime, I've known this land is filled with industrial agriculture. Lands that was once vast prairie and forest stewarded by indigenous peoples now only has small pockets of these ecosystems. As the granddaughter of Jewish refugees fleeing persecution who settled in Illinois, I'm aware that my own family's survival has followed upon the dispossession of others. I'm also aware that the illnesses I and family members carry are connected to harm from carbon and chemical intensive life, including industrial agriculture. Harm that stems from settler colonial, patriarchal and capitalist views of the land as a resource rather than a relation. The Woven Climate Datascapes is a body of work translating climate data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, as abstracted landscapes and waterscapes. I materialized the data as weaving and coiled sculpture using plant fibers and dyes and petrochemical derived medical tubing. I'll share a number of the datascapes as I talk about my research, but I'll only speak directly to a few series within the project. I started making the datascapes in 2015 as an outgrowth of interest in the mechanisms through which we come to understand climate change from data and journalistic narrative to embodied experience. My focus at the time was the drought in my then home state of California and my growing awareness of how the drought as one local manifestation of climate crisis, exacerbated existing injustice, disproportionately harming those already marginalized. I viewed the original datascapes composed of California state climate data as in part a critique of data visualization, not a critique or a um, dismissal of science, I'll add. Um, data is a relatively patriarchal, Western, capitalist, and colonial form of knowledge. It is very useful in its capacity to condense a vast amount of labor, time, and knowledge from across scientific disciplines into a form that can be consumed quickly. But its value as an abstraction is also potentially at shortfall. 
and the selection of what is communicated through data, much is obscured, including the material origins of the data and the violence that climate change really is. Families whose walls are dry, even as the farms next door grow food for the wealthy, the landscape irreparably scarred by extractive industries, the native people whose sacred sites and the water we all rely on to live is destroyed for the sake of corporate profit. In choosing to weave the data, I am reinserting time, labor, materiality, and other forms of knowledge. Knowledge that's embodied, gendered female, indigenous, and relational rather than representational. Um, in this somewhat heavy statement, I do not mean to suggest that indigenous knowledge is one thing or to reinforce the gender binary, but rather to say there are knowledges and people who have been systemically devalued by those who uphold patriarchy and settler colonialism. Weaving an embodied practice is devalued within these systems because of who has traditionally done the work. But weaving is also tied to global histories of resistance and has served as a kind of language for women and marginalized people throughout time. And it's a practice that, that situates one in relation to the world, to other labors, to ecosystems, to materials with ecological and social histories for better and for worse. After the 2016 election, climate scientists and activists rightly feared that data and other knowledge would be erased by the incoming administration, spurring an effort to copy and preserve. Up to this point, my concern had been for the vulnerability of bodies, and I hadn't really understood the data's potential vulnerability. In the wake of the 2017 inauguration, climate information did indeed start disappearing from government websites and environmental agencies were silenced. This attack on climate knowledge went hand in hand with policies of increased climate violence as major pipelines were greenlit and rules protecting water and air from irreversible toxic contamination were rolled back. In this context, I started to view the work as a kind of archive, turning to this history of weaving as a subversive language for women and marginalized people. In this political era, I saw the work of the datascapes less as a critique and more as my attempt at reweaving an intentionally obscured relationships. Relationships between climate change, water, extractive industry, illness, and displacement, between disparate places, between personal and communal loss, and between corporeal and ecological bodies. Concurrent with the 2017 inauguration, I moved from Berkeley, California to Tulsa, Oklahoma to start a residency. Tulsa was once known as the oil capital of the world and is still economically and culturally tethered to oil and gas extraction. Following the lead of others in the climate community, the first task I gave myself upon move upon moving was to copy the full content of the public facing NOAA database that I'd used for my work while in California. As I immersed myself in this database, I became increasingly attentive to how the data was aggregated, presented primarily along politically defined borders. In other words, how a form of knowledge that we take for granted as objective is shaped by other systems. As Donna Haraway puts it in her book, Staying with the Trouble, it matters what thoughts think thoughts. It matters what knowledge is, no knowledge is. It matters what stories tell stories. It matters which concepts think concepts. With a growing awareness of settler colonialism and the relationship between the violence of oil extraction, water, health, and indigenous land rights, I was hesitant to continue reinscribing the borders defined by a settler colonial state in my work. One of the works to emerge from this attention to aggregation and my desire to avoid the state and country data was fractures woven in early 2018. Each fracture is an interpretation of 137 years of annual average temperature that adds up to the full globe, but each is woven in panels reflecting different ways the world is divided by NOAA. Rather than side by side, the panels are stacked, one part of the world holding up another, our human life on land, resting on and putting pressure on the ocean, or the global north on the, corner, on the shoulders of the global south. There's a lot of sky in Oklahoma and living in Tulsa, I often looked up when I sought natural beauty. Sunrises and sunsets were particularly stunning with so much particulate matter in the air from oil refineries, fires and trash incineration. 
A reflection of the time I spent with the sky, the data for fractures ended up taking shape as horizon lines, sunrises, and sunsets. But this particulate matter is not above and external, contained in a beautiful sky. As so many more are acutely aware after this pandemic year, the air connects and is part of us, as are the toxicants it carries, moving in, out, and through our bodies, bringing asthma, cancers, endocrine disorders, and multiple chemical sensitivities. As I worked on the Datascapes project from 2015 to 2019, the climate crisis only got worse by the day, touching more and more of us directly with fires, floods, droughts, and more. Meanwhile, those in power continued to expand fossil fuel extraction while interfering with the production and safekeeping of climate knowledge and seeding divisiveness. The increasing violence of extraction was then justified using the same patriotic language employed by politicians to justify wars. Fault lines, also from 2019, points to the direct relationship between extraction and the state. In 2018, the US became the largest extractor of oil and gas in the world a title claimed through use of the ever more violent methods of hydraulic fracturing and deep water drilling. Fault lines is comprised of 94 to 125 years of temperature data for each of the top six oil extracting states in the US, Texas, North Dakota, Alaska, California, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. The color palette drew from sedimented earth and Oklahoma's landscapes, from red clay soil to prairie grass, Parts of the cloth are left unwoven, pointing to the scars and voids resulting from extraction, and the panels are roughly stitched together, revealing fault lines that reference breaks in the earth and also a fractured social structure. The size of the piece, nine and a half feet by five feet, mimics that of flags used to drape military coffins, a nod to the patriotic language used to justify the violence of extraction and the many casualties it leaves behind human and non-human, inside and outside of the industry. The dislocation series from 2019 begins to consider the relationship between climate crisis and displacement, my personal disjointed relationships to places I've called home and how harm done to the oceans affects everyone, whether on the coast or inland, all right differently, all right differently and unequally. Each piece is an interpretation of temperature data for a place I once called home interwoven with data for the world's oceans. I return to using data defined by state borders while blurring the distinction between borders politically defined and those that are not. One line of data from the state, one from the ocean, one from the state, one from the ocean. The colors and structures are based on my memories and connotations of a place's landscape in the industrial agricultural cornfields that pervade central Illinois, New York City's gridded streets and skyscrapers, Oklahoma's iconic red soil, and the hills of Central California that went from year-round flowers to seemingly year-round fires. The last pieces I'll share I worked on from 2017 to 2019 with the assistance of nine women. Bound is comprised of up to 137 years of temperature data for 300 places around the globe, materialized with 1,500 feet of yarn-wrapped petroleum-derived medical tubing, divided into five-foot lengths. The yarn is dyed with plant and insect-derived dyes and mineral mordants, a global practice that stretches back to long before the age of oil and the production of petrochemical-derived synthetic dyes. Each data set expressed with this yarn along a length of tubing is temperature data for a different city, state, or region of the world. From obsessively copying the NOAA database in 2017, I had spreadsheets with hundreds of data sets. Sifting through the data, it was usually easier to see the clear progression of warming at larger geographic scales. Our individual experiences of climate crisis are of course not legible in such data. Those experiences are vastly unequal, shaped by intersections of human-caused changes in weather patterns with race, gender, class, health, disability, geography, and local policy. While our local and personal experiences of climate crisis are unjustly different, we are all still in a way materially bound together. We are also bound up with the fossil fuel industry 
In Tulsa, with the embodied experience of living in a place that had been made toxic by oil and gas, I felt this entanglement acutely. There's a relationship between the damage done to the earth and the damage done to our bodies by the petrochemical industry, and yet our lives have also become reliant on and entangled with it. Petrochemical pipelines penetrate the earth. Petrochemical derived medical tubing is a pipeline that runs through and around our bodies, used for chemo drug delivery and other medical interventions for illnesses that often have the same causes as ecological destruction. Because I worked on Bound for two years, I exhibited it iteratively, thinking of each installation as a way to reflect different aspects of climate crisis. In the first included in an exhibition about land use in Oklahoma, 15 of the tubes took form as a 24 inch by 60 inch by 10 inch knot, a landscape crisscrossed by oil and gas pipelines. In the second, installed in Asheville, North Carolina, shortly after Hurricane Florence swamped the state, 32 tubes took form as the swirl of a storm moving across a weather map. In the third, I knotted together the tubes for three recent homes, New York, San Francisco, and Tulsa. In the fourth, the tubes became a carpet, climate crisis as the ground we now walk on. And finally, in the fifth, for a show in Oklahoma, the first to include all 300 tubes or all 300 data sets, I installed bounds stretched out to 10 feet by six feet, reflecting at that time on one local manifestation of climate chaos that had shocked Tulsans six months earlier in the spring of 2019, when a month of extreme storms transformed the polluted Arkansas River from a trickle to a roar, overflowing its banks and swallowing up homes. Um, I will stop there and I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Tally. Appreciate everything you've shown and uh, we have, I'm sure, some comments from everybody. Thank you. And uh, Linda, if you would like to get back on camera, we'd like to ta uh, tackle a little bit of the question and answer. I know there's been a lot to absorb right now, so, but our time is limited, so I'm going to move forward with questions. We had one um, fairly substantial question that was interesting. Uh, much of the world population does not have access to art venues where much of the environmental art is shown. What would you suggest for environmental art to best reach the general public, especially those populations who are being most impacted by climate change? Linda, do you have a thought about that at all? Or we could come back to it later too. <laughs> yeah, that's a really, uh, important question that I don't have a good answer to. Um, you know, I'm tempted to say uh, sharing the art virtually, but that requires an access to the technology to see the art virtually. Um, so I don't know, that's something to work on. I, I don't have a good answer, I'm sorry. Great question though. Uh I, I would just add, I'm curious like, who the populations are who aren't accessing and, and what they aren't accessing, because one thing to think about is, um, you know, so many people are making this work from within their own communities and from it within their own situations. And um, it might also be that we're not seeing some of the work um, that's being made. That's true. That's true. And, and now with the internet, we have ways to get the world, the work out that's hyper local and, and get it out too. Well, a lot of our other questions dealt with a little bit more technical side of things. We had several questions, Linda, about the digital printer and uh, what kind you use and um, wh what kind of silk are, is this something you're using within your own home or you're using it within a uh, facility? Yeah, I had a professional printer do the printing on a very large format printer. Uh, it was probably about 60 inches wide and uh, it was an Epson printer. So that was how I did it. And I was really lucky because the printer actually is in the same building as my studio. And there was no way to do a color calibration between my scans and his printer. So I brought my laptop in and we were running test prints. <laughs> that was how I did it. it, was so convenient. 
That's great. And that is, uh, you use a silk, that's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty widely available. That Yeah, the silk. silk I use comes from Inkjet Fabrics, which is a affiliate company of Jacquard Products, who makes the silk dyes that I use. Wonderful. Um, we did have some questions about uh, if the data that you use from NOAA and so forth, if it's, if you're able to use all that, you know, the screen shares and so on without any copyright infringement, if they're available to all as sort of open source. So anything that's produced by the US government is copyright free and available to any US citizen to use. So there's no problem with that. Yeah, Tally, did you have any comment about that too? Because you did the same thing and, and downloading a lot of data. Um, yes, I'm using uh, work from a public facing database that anybody can access online um, and use as they would like as well. Yeah, okay. Um, we had a question, uh, we got some more questions in um, chat, but anyway. Um, we had a question about, just a second, um, for Linda Gass, do you take any steps in your work to use materials that are environmentally, that environmentally safe as possible? Yes, I absolutely do. So the dyes that I use are uh, officially uh, labeled as safe, uh, non-toxic by OSHA and uh, I use a water soluble resist so that I'm not using a product that's petroleum product based and it also doesn't need to be dry cleaned out. Um, the batting that I use is recycled polyester and uh, what other, I'm blanking on others, but I yeah. do other things as well. Okay. Um... Let me see. Um, Tally, we had a question about how you wrap the tubes. <laughs> um, they're, they're coiled. Um, so just take the thread and hand wrap it. That's it. Okay. Um, there's no, there's no knotting or anything. Um, so basically, um, in order to end one piece, I just start the next thread over that one and, and keep going. Yeah, and we had a question also. Um, do you see uh, any of the natural dyes and mordants in your bound series to have healing properties, if you will, to balance the petrochemical medical tubing? Um, so working with plant and insect derived dyes is, um, you know, a way for me to connect or like feel a different kind of relationship to the world. Mm -hmm. um, but I also try to be careful, like I don't wanna uphold the plant and insect derived dyes as some kind of like <laughs> environmental purists, um, purism, which is in part actually what led me to start incorporating more petrochemical products into my work. Um, the medical tubing, and I also work with fishing line for some work about the oceans. Um, so I do see them as like a kind of counter to each other. That contrast um, is important, but yeah, um, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Um, we did have a question. Uh, have you found any data that is positive, giving us reason to hope for the future of the environment in, in all your, I mean, you did, uh, Linda, point out the fact that if there's a three foot rise versus a six foot rise, that, that is different. But is there anything in the data sets that was surprising? Hmm. Linda, do you want to go first? Or... <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually the data that I've looked at um, hasn't been super hopeful, but you know, aside from data, I do see hopeful things in terms of actions that people and local governments are taking. So, you know, I don't know that 
any of that. You know, Tally alluded the, to this in her talk. There's a lot of things that's not captured in the data that we collect and process and have access to. So I see a lot of uh, anecdotal and experiential things going on that give me hope. Yeah. Um, Tally? <laughs> yeah. I have a couple answers. I mean, hope, hope isn't a word I use a lot when I'm thinking about climate crisis. Like the reality is that we're in it and it's happening, but we do have choices about how bad it gets. Um, and some of what you see in the data is how much human action plays a role. And because of that, it means that we can take human action to curtail how bad things are going to get, right? Like um, during the Dust Bowl, you actually see warmer temperatures in the central, um, south central US. Um, and that was because of horrible agricultural practices at the time. So you, if you see in the data how, um, how humans are making things worse, then you also see that there are choices for making things better. Um, I mean, I do think that, you know, because of some incredible grassroots activism over the years, we now have an administration who is less horrible um, and seems to be listening to a certain extent um, to those who are most marginalized and actually taking seriously the need to cut carbon emissions. Um, but yeah. yeah. Great. Um, we did have uh, some people ask, uh, are, uh, I know Linda, you're doing some public art proposals right now. Are, it seems to me that that's a way to incorporate some of this data and this concept into a wider public audience. Is that part of the basis? In other words, are you using some of this in these uh, other proposals you're working on or could, could conceive working on? Well, um, the public art commission that I'm working on right now um, isn't climate data related, uh, but it does have an environmental theme in it. It's about the watersheds of Los Altos. Uh, and that's probably about all I can say about it at this point since we're in the early phases of the project, but I will be sharing more over the coming months. So, um, but one of the things that, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Well, and we know, I, I put out a, a, a prompt to get people to check Instagram because we know we followed a number of your projects from the past where you were dealing with the plantings and so on in, in environmental sensitive areas. So it's very interesting. Um, Tally, I didn't, I didn't know if you had something to add to that, so. No. Okay. Well, we, another couple of just quick questions. Um, the stiffener you use, Linda, can you re repeat the name of that? Yeah, you know, I can just put it in the chat, but it's Paverpol, P A V E R P O L, I think it is. So. Okay. That's great. You know how it is. These groups, we all have our favorite uh, <laughs> questions about technology of our yeah. own. <laughs> It's really yeah. funny. Like to me, it smells like white glue. It might be all it is, but <laughs> yeah. it's a specially marketed fabric stiffener. Yeah. Um, and I guess one more question for Tally here. Can you talk more about the different iterations of bound? Did you discover, could you consider each form to be ephemeral to a specific exhibition or might you recreate the same overall forms from earlier iterations in future displays? Um, I mean, I think it, it's possible that I would recreate them. So all of the tubes are individual and get installed and configured for each show. Um, and, you know, I'm always kind of responding to context. So I'm not sure that forms will ever be exactly the same. Um, but, you know, certainly like that storm map form, I think will appear in other ways in future iterations. Um, their rug form will appear in other ways in future iterations, but they won't be exactly the same. Okay, well, that's a good question. 
And we did have someone in chat saying that Pavapol is no longer being manufactured. So we may have to look for alternatives. So um, I want to thank you all and definitely thank our um, listeners today. Please allow me to organize myself here. Thank you. Um, we've had a wonderful presentation by Linda and Tally, and it's wonderful that our audience can join us. Um, we hope you've been inspired today, finding tools for analysis and action as well as studio practice. Um, we, I want to put on a, a thank you once again for our sponsors and our, just one second here, our important sponsors that make this series possible. We want to thank Sakwa for hosting us. The recording will be available on YouTube in the next week. Uh, by the way, this was the 43rd Textile Talk uh, presentation and those are all on YouTube on the playlist. Next Wednesday, March 10th, Textile Talks hosts conversations with the artists, season after season, sponsored by Sakwa. And at this time, I'd like to thank you all for attending and enjoy um, spring as it starts to poke forward with its annual renewal after a long winter. Thank you all.